Thank you, Yvonne. This morning, I'd like you to just take a moment, and I'd like to continue the series that I started. I'm going to begin my own series. I guess I should say that. When I do have time for the sermon time, I'd like to stay in the book of 2 Corinthians. And last time, when we began to talk about Paul, what we wanted to bring out was the title that he had as pastor. And the reason why this is so meaningful to me is because now it's a title that's being given to me, and I'm giving it a lot more thought. So I want you to take just a moment and just briefly in your mind, if you were to create a job description for a pastor, what are five characteristics that you would want your pastor to have? Just think quickly. What do you think? Patience. Love. What was that? Spiritual. Wisdom. Compassion and friendliness. All right. So, if you were Paul and you have just been given the task to begin to take the gospel into the world, and you have all of the globe, as we talked last time, to work with, where would you start a church? Because when we think of pastor, we always think in connection to a church. So if there aren't any churches yet, where would you begin a church? And Paul, strategically, as last time we looked, he began in Corinth. And I don't know why my PowerPoint is not showing on the screen. He began in Corinth, and he strategically began in four places. And as we look at the places where he began his churches, we see that it was strategically placed so that there was a harbor on both sides, on east and west, and also land that went up to the north. So people that began to hear the good news could take it with them when they came into the commerce, into corn, which was very commercial, very prosperous, a lot of money, a lot of pleasure. They could take it out um, by sea from both coast and up as they wanted to. So Paul had the church then he began strategically there in Corinth. Now, he went to another church that he had planted and he was waiting there and he began to get rumors. You know, there's nothing like a good rumor or gossip. It just seems to go. And it seems that people were saying that there were two groups in Corinth that were trying to influence just the beginning of a church plant. One group was called the spirit people. And these spirit people were following Apollos. And Apollos was a very dignified, impressive man, very versed in Greek culture, Hellenistic thought, wonderful speaker. On the other hand, there was another group called the Judaizers. And these Judaizers were people who said, you know what, it's okay if you bring in Gentiles, but they have to keep to the Mosaic law. Okay, so you have two groups influencing the church. So Paul has to address this. And so thank you, Pastor. So we see the places where Paul began the churches, and we see how strategic they were placed. So what about if you're Paul and you write your own job description? This is why I qualify to be a pastor. What if he put it in the Corinthian times and he said, Apostle available will work for room and board. God trained workmanship uses only authentic message and method approved by Jesus Christ. No manipulation, no cheap tricks experience can take anything and survive. Okay, so what about if that church plant says, though, you know what, Paul, good job description, but we need a letter of recommendation. We need 
you to bring in something from somebody else that endorses everything you said. And you have another group, this group of people saying, you know, you're just not up to par. You don't look the part. You don't sound the part. So, if you were Paul, how would you react? Let's turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 3. And as you do so, I am going to put up the text. And when I put the text up, what I want you to know is that I have highlighted the words so that they begin to connect. One of the reasons I'm going to do that is because when we read scripture, the author who wrote the book had an intent in mind as to how to communicate his message. What did he really want to say? And so as we look at the words and we begin to see Paul's defense of his ministry and of his own personhood and of him being a pastor, we want to see how the words begin to connect with each other. So let's bow our heads. We have our Bibles open. We're going to put the text up. And let's just pause for a moment of prayer before we begin. Dear God, I ask that the Holy Spirit please be here as we open your word. Please speak to us. Please help us to see you. And please, above all things, when we become more like you, in the name of Jesus, we ask your favor. Amen. All right, so I told you about the spirit people. And I told you about Apollos and how eloquent he was and the Judaizers. So we're going to now look at the text. And when you study your Bible, one of the things that I like to do is I like to begin to highlight the repetition of words that I see so that I can look conceptually and begin to pick out the topics. So we're going to be look at this text. We're going to read it, believe it or not, this morning, we're going to read all of 2 Corinthians 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? So Paul is talking to the church. And he, the Judaizers have said, you know what, Paul, you need to bring in some letters of recommendation. And Paul is saying, do I really need to commend myself again? Do I need, like some other people do, letters of recommendation to you and from you? And notice what he says to the church in Corinth. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts and known and read by everybody. What if in the new ministry that Pastor Jen is going to, what if they say, well, Pastor Jen, how did your ministry go in Vienna? What was it like? And she can just say, you know what? Take a look at my congregation in Vienna. Those are my letters of recommendation. If you want to see the kind of work that I have done, look at them. They're letters written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. And Paul goes on to say, you show that you are a letter from Christ, speaking to the congregation, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You see, the spirit people had made a lot of saying that they had already attained perfection. The Judaizers were saying, you've got to follow the letter of the law. You have to keep that. And Paul is saying, you know what? It's about the spirit of the living God, not writing on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Where is Paul finding this confidence? Through Christ before God. Not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, where the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So look at this. Paul is saying, you know what? You're asking me for letters.
letters of recommendation that I'm a good pastor. The spirit people say I don't look the part and I don't speak the part. The Judaizers are saying, you know what, you need to get these Gentiles into wine. They need to be following Jewish law. And Paul is saying here, you know what, my ministry comes from God. And if you want to see what it looks like to have a spirit-filled life, look to the people who are themselves my letters of, con of recommendation. So, he is saying, the confidence that I have in ministry is because I have been given that competence from God. No one said in the characteristics of the pastors that they need to be competent. But Paul brings it up. And we do need to be competent. But that competence comes from God. And he says, these are the things that you can see in a ministry when it has to do with the spirit of the living God. So moving on, we can see now if we highlight that the commendation, the confidence, the competence in false ministry all comes from God. Now, if we want to begin to tie in God's word with our life, we can begin to see that Paul said, my confidence or my credibility as a pastor is because of God. And my commendation and my competence is because of God. Now, if you look at 2 Corinthians 3, and I outline the verses, Paul is saying, yes, we do commend ourselves, but you commend us, and our ministry commends us because it's been signed by Christ, written with the Spirit, written on our hearts, known and read by all. So it's not about me, but it's from God. And as ministers of the New Covenant, it's not about the letter, but it's the Spirit giving life. And so Paul begins in his argument to try to bring these new believers to see that as their pastor, his ministry is really not based on what they're saying about him, but it is only founded on the fact that he has been commended. So as we look at this text and we tie it in and we bring in the word for us today, if we are to look at ourselves as the Vienna Church, whose letter of recommendation are you? How would we look? Would we be letters that reflect the letter of the Spirit? What would make us credible to those that look on? What would build confidence in us? What would make us feel competent? When we stop to reflect at these things and we ask, what does this really mean for me? We have to go back to the place where Paul found his confidence. Our confidence comes from the same place as Paul. It's a divine element. Remember, it was before God. And God's role in our life, in our ministry, in our life situation, looking at them, then we have greater confidence in God because our confidence comes from God. So we respond to God by thanking Him with new confidence and taking a first step in an area of risk in ministry. Now stop and think about what ministry means and the fact that the word minister is used. It's not pastor, it's minister. We are all ministers. We are all part of ministry. So stop and think for a moment. If you feel that comes from God, and that God has a role that gives us confidence in ministry, we can take a risk. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, we have a program here at the church about discipleship. How did discipleship start? 
where did it start? We're going to go to Israel and Turkey. Why did discipleship start? Now, some of you may not have made lunch plans, and you're saying, you know what? I don't think I can go to that. But let me just ask you to take a risk. Stay for lunch. There may be a few more carbs than we're used to having sometimes, is what I hear. But that's okay. The multiplication of fish, okay, will be there for us. Take a risk and stay. And I'll tell you why. Even if you didn't bring someone, the someone who came today for that program needs to see your reflection. They need to see your smile. They need to feel your handshake. They need to have somebody say, hi, I'm really happy you're here. You need to be here. Take a risk. Join us at 2 o'clock. It'll be fabulous. Okay? I will, I will be vulnerable with my reputation as a beginning pastor to say it's going to be good or I will give you your time back. How's that? Okay? So come out. Take a risk in ministry. So, again, what does it mean to me? It means that we become confident in God's role in our credibility and competence. Come out. Be confident that you're part of the Vienna Church, you're part of what's happening here, that your confidence, your competence, your commendation is all based on these three C's we need to remember because it's God's role. It's what he's doing in the church what he's doing in you and what he's doing with the spirit. So, we're going to now tie it in quickly with the rest of the scripture. And I want you to follow, follow me. And if you want to read in your Bible, you can. If not, I have it up here. So we're moving to a different section. Paul is still making his defense in the church. And he says, now this ministry that brought death was engraved on letters of stone, came with glory so the Israelites could not steadily look at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Do you remember in Exodus 34, Moses, when he would go into the tent of meeting and he would meet with God face to face, what would happen would be that his face would shine so unbelievably that he would cover it with a veil so that he could then talk to the people without this light shining out to them. So Paul is talking about this and he says, if the ministry condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what, for what was glorious, has not glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And he's going to begin to make comparisons. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory that lasts? Therefore, since we have such hope, we are very bold. And then he brings the point in even further. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at while the radiance was fading away. Now, notice the point here that Paul is making. Exodus 34 tells us that Moses put the veil on when he spoke with the people. And Paul is saying that he did this because his radiance is fading away. Now I want to try and experiment, okay? Turn to the person who is seated to your right and just intently look at them for three seconds. Just be intent. One, two, three. Turn to the person on your left and look intently. Stare. One, two, three. Okay? As you did that, as you took a really good look, what made it possible for you to see everything about that person's face is that there was nothing between you. Right? Nothing between you. So, the veil that Moses 
put on his face. Actually, what Paul is saying is he kept it on so that the people would not notice when the light, the radiance, was beginning to go down. Now, human nature, the way that we are, we are so, let's see, how should I say, observant. We notice everything. Can you imagine Moses with the veil over his face? If you began to notice that there wasn't as much light shining on his face, can you imagine the little rumors there? Well, you know what? Moses needs another trip to the tent of meeting. Well, you know what? I don't see that glory so much today. No wonder I heard him talking to Sephora so loudly. You know, we are so critical. He put that on so people would not notice when the radiance was fading. So, Paul then begins to talk about how the Judaizers, the people in the church who wanted the Gentiles to observe all of the law, he says, but their minds were made dull, for to this day the veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their heart. There are obstacles, Paul is saying. For us to really see clearly, there are obstacles. And he is saying it is like a veil. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, Paul is saying here that what we find is freedom when we turn to Jesus. We don't need a veil. On the other hand, also, it says, we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. So, when you turned and looked at each other for those three seconds, and you fully looked at someone's face, you can notice whether there is a reflection there or not. There is a reflection of the Lord's glory, because the more we look at Jesus, the more we come, become transformed in his likeness with that same glory through the Spirit so that others can see that glory in us. So, Paul is saying here that there are veils that can veil the heart. But when the Spirit comes in, the veil is removed from the heart, it's revealed from the mind, and we can approach face to face. What might be veils, do you think, in our lives? Without a veil, others can see the increasing glory in us. But what do you think might be veils in our life? What might be obstacles that really keep us from reflecting God's glory? To appear respectable. What else? Fear. What else? Pride. What else? Clothing, sin. Now, do you see those characteristics on my face? I can't see them on your face either with this veil. It's time to get rid of the veil. It's time to let others see who constantly beholding looks like 
in transformation, it's time to fasten our eyes on him so that others will note his reflection on us. So when we think of veils, I want you to look at the words of a famous reformer about what he said about the design of the gospel. The image of God defaced by sin may be repaired within us. What Paul has said in all of 2 Corinthians 3 is that when it comes to ministry, our competence and our confidence and our boldness comes from God. But not only that, something very beautiful takes place for us. And that is the sense of freedom that we find without the veils. And it also is the likeness that takes place in our lives that is so revealing that everyone around us sees that reflection. I am looking at Jesus and the fact that I am looking at Jesus is creating a reflection in me that when you observe me, it doesn't matter the angle that you are looking at me, you see Jesus reflecting out. This morning, I'd like to pray for us, and I would really like to pray that we become a people and a church where any pastor can say, would you like to know what my ministry is like? Look at my congregations. There's my letter. And when they look at that letter, they see the reflection. And when they see the reflection, it's something that draws them to want whatever it is that you have. Because truly, we can promote all that we want. The people will never come because of that promotion. They will come because of the attraction. So let's bow our heads right now. Dear God, as we sit in this moment, and as we have heard from the pastor's heart in Second Corinthians, we are reminded that as others look at us, we want to be able to reflect you. But many of us have veils and obstacles in our lives that prevent them. So this morning we ask that the Holy Spirit work in our lives in such a way that those veils just drop and that we may face to face begin to behold Jesus in such a way that we experience freedom and we experience the joy of reflecting you to others not so much for their sake but because of the experience that we have and will have the closeness to you and a sense of your love, of your embrace, of your transformation and of your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask and pray for this miracle. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, uh, number 500. Time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word, make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in to see. Take time to be holy. Let world 
washes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trusting his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus lead by his spirit to fountains of love. Thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. For our benediction, I have something that is uh, always challenging, and that is to say goodbye to a friend. Uh, Pastor Jen will begin her maternity leave uh, very soon. Uh, however, after her maternity leave, instead of coming back to us, she is going to be going to another group. Uh, Pastor Jen, some of you know, has had a new charge for a long time to be in charge of our building a new church, a church of faith. And uh, she has that dream to fill. It's not a uh, officially <coughs> ratified or final committees yet, but I'm told that it is a, it is a one day uh, Pastor Jim will be working with a new church at the CPC this year. It's a, an exciting thing, but it's at the same time even if I didn't have that in mind, it would be uh, talking to the lovers so much. I'm sharing this now. I asked her to have an opportunity to leave uh, so that she uh, would not be embarrassed by this. But we'll have a farewell talk with her next week. She is aware of that. But she is not aware that we will have a money that other folks are involved in and significant events in someone's life. So we will have a money tree for her. She's uh, will be having an extended family soon. She will be uh, possibly even having a high school teacher that's in the control of her. So it seems like a very uh, appropriate thing. I wanted to have you notice so that uh, we would become in the planes in the park. They're a little hard to get put up the tree. So, uh, so complicated for that. And uh, if you can, stay with the product. Many of you have stuff that follows. We're going to be having this in the gym. So it'll be comfortable and warm. And uh, it'll be a time of celebration. And yet makes the process of some of the So uh, I hope you're all here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message today, how timely and how sweet. You do want to grow. You know our mission for the year. You know our vision that we will become ever more transparent, open, honest, encouraging, and uplifting to our life. And we can only do that if we live today in our business. Father, and we entrust our individual future to you, as well as the future of our churches, and you will entrust us all to you, the Lord and our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you may be seated.